day, catch the train series. My name is Magdalena Krosa, and I'm the country specialist for Poland, Germany, and CEE region. Today's event will focus on the support and solution available for UK railroad companies when they wish to trade internationally. I'm delighted to say that this event has been organized in with our partners, Department for International Trade and Railway Industry Association. We really hope that you find this event helpful and insightful. And without any further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker, Donald McNeil, Head of in Transport Infrastructure for the Department for International Trade. Over to you, Donald. Thank you, Magda. Um, so, first of all, apologies, everyone, for the lack of a visual this morning. Um, I appear to be having some technical issues in the office. Um, but, look, welcome along to this latest edition of um, the Catch the Train series. Um, on behalf of the Department for International Trade, let me start with just a couple of thanks um, to our partners in this series, the Railway Industry Association and Santander UK, to the businesses presenting at today's session, um, and all who have presented previously um, at the, the three other sessions we've had so far. Um, and most importantly, to all of you who have logged on this morning um, because you're interested in learning more about the challenges and, more importantly, how to overcome those challenges when looking to grow your businesses through international trade. As the web page for today's event states, international trade is increasingly more desirable to UK companies. And that's the case for a number of reasons. Goods exporting companies are on average 21% more productive. They tend to be more resilient, innovative and profitable. Um, and research suggests they also tend to pay 7% higher wages. But one in eight firms with a turnover um, of over £500,000 are not exporting when they could be. And also there are areas of untapped export potential across the UK. The global trading landscape has changed. The UK is now an independent trading nation. Global trade has fallen due to COVID-19 and new markets are emerging and growing. Those new markets are clearly important, but Europe also continues to be an important market for the UK rail sector. Eastern Europe is projected to have one of the highest growth rates in the world at 2.7%. And more mature markets like Western Europe will also continue to grow due to orders of high-speed trains in Europe and important mass transit projects. The UK is one of the world's top six exporting nations. We punch above our weight in exports and boast a highly capable export support market, offering high-quality business and export support to UK businesses. DIT's trade and investment support extends to all parts of the UK through our overseas network international events programme and online services. It means DIT services, such as support from overseas teams, one of whom you'll hear from later, the Great Dog of UK website, international events and missions are available to all companies across all of the UK. Face-to-face -face support for exporters in England is delivered via a network of around 300 international trade advisors who are based around the country, supported by a further 140 television sorry, telephone-based staff. Um, this support aims to help UK businesses to export and grow their business internationally. That support includes sector and cross-cutting campaigns such as clean growth, the new UK Export Academy that you may hear a bit more about later today, a network of some 420 regional export champions um, who provide mentoring support, a parliamentary export champions programme, the Prime Minister's trade envoys and our HM trade commissioners across the world, online export and trade support, and then we have regional trade and investment hubs um, dotted around the UK. Alongside DIT support, um, UK Export Finance, which is the UK's um, export credit agency, also has a network of 24 specialist export finance managers located across the whole of the UK who provide specialist support on trade and export or finance to UK exporters and suppliers, particularly SMEs. As a department, we are always looking at the relevance of our offer and how we can help UK businesses meet their export ambitions. Let me give you a recent example. Just last week, DIT launched the Export Support Service, a new helpline and online service where all UK businesses can get answers to practical questions about exporting to Europe. The service is a one-stop shop 
and brings together UK government information, making it easier for exporters to access advice and support. All UK businesses can use this free service, no matter the size of the business or which part of the UK in which you are based. DIT will continue to work with businesses and business representative groups from all sectors in all parts of the UK to help make the service as useful as possible for businesses. You can access the Export Support Service at gov.uk slash ask dash export dash support dash team um, or by calling 0300 303 8955 and I hope that someone will drop those details into the chat um, where you'll be put in touch with a member of the dedicated export support team. So in closing, um, there's a huge amount of support and desire to help you maximise UK export potential from great partners like RIA and Santander, from government, as I've touched on, and from the companies who have freely given their time today to share the lessons they have learned. Um, and I hope the, the rest of this session um, is informative and helps you get out and export. Thank you. Uh, Magda, Donald, thank you very much for your welcome and opening remarks. Um, I'm Halil Bedevi. I head up the Rail, Aerospace, Defence and Advanced Manufacturing subsectors at Santander Corporate and Commercial here in the UK. Uh, as well as having a short slot towards the end, I'll be the moderator uh, for today's event. So in the next section, we'll be hearing from three rail supply chain companies about international trading, and their journeys who will share their experiences and top tips for us. Um, I'd like to start with Rita Masia, from, uh, who is the Global Bid Manager from Alt Ultra. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Rita, and over to you. Thank you, Aliyah. I'm just going to wait for my presentation to be uploaded. I think it's back. No problem. Um, as Ariel said, my name is uh, Rita Magia, um, and I am the global bid manager uh, for rail projects at Altro Limited. Altro is a manufacturing company based uh, in the UK and is also the oldest company in the Altro Group uh, PLC and has been operating um, since 1919. Uh, that's a photo of our founders from back here. Well, we have two manufacturing plants uh, based one in the UK and one in Germany. And uh, on this slide, uh, you see our key figures taken uh, from our last audit account uh, in 2020. As you can see from the figures, although our turnover decreased during um, the COVID pandemic, uh, as you can expect, our profit remains stable um, compared to the previous uh, to the previous year. Uh, we manufacture and market ultra safety flooring and wall systems, and our sister company, uh, Auto Glim, deals in and exports uh, vehicle care and uh, car uh, car wash products. Now, if you have a car. And you have not come across auto green products, you don't know what you're missing. So um, that's my plug for you there. At Altro, we have two main divisions in which we operate for the sales of floors and walls. Construction, where we work in a variety of segments like health, healthcare, education, etc. And transport, where we supply floor covering for rolling stock, for rail, bus, and other vehicles. We're working with OEMs uh, like Alstom, Siemens, CRRC, you name it, and also operators like uh, Transport for London or Deutsche Bahn in Germany. We are also known as the inventors of safety flooring and uh, recognized as the pioneer in floor recycling, as we were the uh, we are the co-founders of Record Floor, which is a UK vinyl tape back scheme and we are proud to say that since 2009 we haven't sent any material uh, to landfill 
Now, this is going to be a whistle stop to our export in Germany, which started around the 1960s. And our first uh, rail project um, was supplying our flooring uh, to um, the New York subway trains. A couple of decades later, we acquired uh, subsidiaries in Boston, in Germany, and in Sweden. In 2004, uh, we acquired um, our California subsidiary. Then we acquired the one in Madrid in 2005, Australia in 2009, and in 2015, we, we uh, acquired also one of our German competitors, Devalon, and we added another manufacturing and distribution subsidiary to our group. Our most recent subsidiary is out of Japan in 2019, and we also to continue to export via a large range of distributors and agents. So what were our key challenges when we started exporting? One of the challenges about exporting is that no matter how strong your brand is in your own market, going overseas, it's not just about replicating what you do at home. You need to be very selective. For example, out of all the sectors that we could have exported into, we selected healthcare in construction and transport, focusing on rail specifically, for as our two growth, uh, key growth sectors. Then we looked at countries that were favorable for selling into those sectors. So for instance, the Middle East, so my first tip for you is that, of course, you need a strong brand in your own market and you need to be able to sustain the competition abroad, but you don't necessarily need to focus on what you did in your own market. You could export in a completely different sector and be successful. Another challenge is to make uh, the mistake of taking too many countries at once. The success of our own subsidiary in the past uh, 10 years, in fact, is due to the fact that we became much more focused. In the past, we used to um, go for 30 or 40 countries and spread our resources very, very thin. And if you're going to go overseas, you need your resources. So you're better off if you could be focused more geographically, if you can, as we have done, or oh, even better by sector, as I mentioned just now. A third challenge when you go overseas is that you're very reliant on people replicating your brand. So, of course, recruiting the right people in business is always important, but particularly um, when you work overseas, because you relies in on, on people to cascade down your values, your uh, missions, um, and my thing for you in this in this case is that you really have to make sure that the most senior people you've got operating for you from overseas are really on board with your mission, your vision, your core values, and your strategies, of course. A fourth challenge of exporting is also deciding your route to market. And if you can't afford to establish your own organization uh, overseas, you may decide to appoint an agent or a distributor. And that can be your strategy if that's all you can afford. And looking back uh, to our exporting journey, we only had six or seven very good distributors around the world. And where we had the weak distributors, we decided that we had to take control of our own destiny and we set up our own subsidiary. So my next tip is that if you want to set up a subsidiary, but you can only afford to invest a limited amount of resources, then your strategy may be that you can only go to one country overseas, or you could have a transition strategy whereby you start with an agent, you might move to a distributor as business increases, you further integrate the distributors, and then if the opportunity is there, then you might want to set up your own subsidiary when the time is right. But 
having a good distributor can be a very cost effective strategy. You could have a really good distributor, for instance, let's say in Belgium, a small country, because, you know, it's not going to make a big difference to have a subsidiary. This is, you know, it's they, that the market is not that big. So my tip to you in that case is to ask the question, is your distributor going to have enough time, focus, inclination, skills and resource to maximize the opportunity for you in that particular market? Uh, Fifth challenge was also with the products that we sell because they are premium products that are highly engineered and therefore very difficult to sell overseas. But this is uh, this may not be the case with your product. So take for instance our sister company Auto Gleam. Uh, people wake up on a sun on a Saturday morning and decided to wash their car their car and they can go online and buy their products. So you might find that a really good distributor can sell can sell that, and we have one in Australia, uh, for instance. You don't need a, a subsidiary to sell something like uh, our, our products for Autoblim. But um, my tip will be that if in, for you, it might be sufficient just to have a decent digital offering uh, overseas as a more direct way to penetrate the market, at least initially. And now I gave you quite a few reasons for, uh, I mean, I spoke about some of the challenges that you, that you may encounter when you decide to explore. And so you might wonder, is this worth it? And, uh, some people may tell you that. You don't have to export. You can be equally successful or just at home. And they will be telling you the truth. However, I have a three more reasons why you might want to consider about having an export business. So for many years at Alto, we have been saying that we wanted to reduce the dependence, our dependence on the UK market in case something really bad happens. And then something bad did happen. In 2007, we went into a recession, which was heavier than anywhere else in the world for our construction market, which is about 75% of our turnover. And at that point, we were very grateful to have an export strategy that effectively buffered our company from what potentially could have been a very big risk. A second reason for Alfro not relying on our own market came when Brexit started to get implemented. Regardless of how you feel about Brexit politically, because I'm not going to enter into that, <laughs> that became another reason why we needed to be not as resilient, uh, sorry, not as reliant on the UK market. And we were lucky to have a European manufacturing plant in Germany um, to reassure those customers in Europe, they were worried about Brexit supply chain problems. So we avoided that problem that some, you know, of our competitors were having. And finally, the third reason, uh, like, like we didn't have enough challenges, then the COVID pandemic came along. And once again, we got lucky in that the UK was more badly hit at a time where other countries hadn't really been affected by, by COVID. So they were performing at higher levels than the UK. And again, when the UK started to recover a little bit from COVID, and that, you know, um, that gave us a chance to support the export businesses that weren't maybe been affected by the pandemic. But basically we had the, the the pandemic at different times, we had the effect of the pandemic on our business at different times during during this uh, year and a half. So these are three practical examples uh, why reducing your dependence on one market is a good strategy. So um, I think the challenge for small and medium businesses in terms of exporting to Europe right now are very difficult, but they are not impossible. 
you just have to become more knowledgeable and you have to be committed. And uh, if we were starting now, yes, it would be a little bit more different, difficult to take Europe on, but we will probably do just one country at a time and move from there. So to summarize my tip for exporting, number one, try different markets or business approaches to that uh, of your own market. Focus geographically or even better by sector. Recruit the best people for your overseas operation, and that's more important than in your own market. Decide the root market that's best for you, or have a transition strategy instead. And remember, you could adopt a digital strategy as well as more traditional routes to market. And focus your resources on one market, if that's all you can afford it, and expand gradually and sustainably. And finally, you don't have to export, but exporting can work like your insurance policy in times of great challenges, like those where we are experiencing. Thank you very much. Rita, thank you very much for your insights and advice there and sharing your uh, thoughts and your journey, journey with us. Uh, I'm sure we'll tap into your uh, knowledge again in the uh, Q&A and, and discussion session at the end. Thank you again. So next, uh, we were due to have David Brooks from Elite KL, but unfortunately he can't be with us. He can't join us today. So we'll go straight to uh, uh, Jonathan Eddy, uh, who's the CEO of B Hetworth and Company. Uh, Jonathan, good morning. Thanks for joining us. And uh, over to you when you're ready, please. Hello, uh, so I'm having technical difficulties with Jonathan, so I didn't know whether you wanted to move on with Ian. Yes, okay, that, that's great. So thank you. And uh, so we go over to Ian Wenman from Viva Rail. Uh, Ian is the uh, um, uh, CA, he's uh, a director of Viva Rail. Thank you, Ian, uh, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Ian Wenman, Director Shareholder of Viva Rail, quite a different company from Rita's insofar as we sell trains and power units. And so it's um, a very lumpy and, and, and a different way of rolling out and exporting. We have been trading for about five, six years now and been on a very steep learning curve in all things, including the fact that we've had to develop our trains and our modular power systems, and most recently a fast charge system for trains, which as you can imagine, um, has involved a lot of research and development. So uh, having done all of that, we've also had to look at where we're going with regard to selling the product, which I repeat that it's, it's big lumpy amounts of kit, uh, which people won't be buying uh, in great volume. So the UK sector, we've sold three um, uh, three fleets of trains there. Um, uh, US train has got, gone across to uh, America about three or four months ago, and they've recently ordered a second one, so we'll be getting another one out there shortly. Um, and uh, so it's very exciting times for us generally. When we look at uh, the export situation, we are, have the train in the US. We are running the UK's first passenger approved battery train at COP26. We've got work on, and we've been working on the Central American pitch for quite some time. Uh, there's a lot happening over there, so some interesting market for us as well as uh, North America. And um, we're working closely in Europe uh, as well. More importantly, we have a pipeline of many, many uh, millions and uh, it, it, it's growing all the time. People are approaching the company from around the world as far as, as far afield as Australasia, um, Far East and so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's people coming to us. So it's not so much about us marketing uh, our products specifically into sectors emails ping in uh, and interest comes from around the world because they, they, they have read about what we're doing and read about the battery train. Um, so it's very interesting times, very exciting times. Um, and 
we, we, we um, are working hard to transfer pipeline into actual firm orders. So what we have done is work closely with the UKEF through this period. We are a small team. We haven't got a huge bus level of support and backup. Um, and <coughs> excuse me, we found ourselves regularly talking to the team in New York, uh, our local team regularly. We have two good key contacts we work with closely there. And uh, also we've had meet meetings with, set with people in uh, Mexico, for instance. Uh, again, the UK EM team have been very helpful consularly, um, locally in those areas and been very useful. Our key takeaways are that uh, we, need to, we needed to learn what was available, i.e. bonds, um, working capital support, etc., which was fine. I'm a, I'm a chartered accountant by background, so I managed to pick it up quite quickly. But for the rest of the team, it wasn't quite so easy. Um, and of course, they were the people out there in the field selling the products, and they needed to be able to sell it to the people that they were meeting out there so that they could explain what was available to our prospective customers. Um, that hasn't always been easy. Uh, it, has, it has involved a lot of effort on our part to, to try and explain what's available. And it hasn't always translated well in terms of them being able to explain it particularly well. And again, because it's a small team, the person that's out there wasn't me. Um, so <laughs> explaining how uh, a bond might work isn't the easiest thing uh, long distance. Also, the other thing we discovered was we, we got the UK um, support from the government very quickly, very keen to help us, as you might imagine. Uh, but what we didn't reckon on was our bank, who we thought would come with us on the journey, turned around and said, well, no, you're, you're a new company. We're not, we're not interested in helping you with your UKF. So we then had to find uh, other banks, which again, we've, we found those very quickly with help of UKF, um, and, and that worked very well. But it, we, didn't, we didn't expect that. So things come left field, which you, you don't always expect. Um, and then the other thing is work clo working closely with the UK EF teams we found very helpful to help us in our exporting. And obviously, they got far more experience than, than most of us. And so uh, keeping, keeping in touch, learning about the changes there and you know, changing the names, the changing of people, the changing of products is so important because it, it is interesting and exciting times. And I don't doubt that things will change again shortly as um, the government looked to recover from COVID and looking to uh, find ways in which to encourage exports. So I think in essence, keeping it brief, that's where we are. And obviously I'll pick up any questions later in the, in the discussions, but uh, you know, we're, we're quite a, uh, an interesting situation being a company in the right place at the right time with the products that we've got. Uh, and, and we're learning very quickly. And Halil, I think that probably finishes me for now. So I will close off at that point and let you move on. Thank you. Uh, Ian, uh, many thanks. So uh, I look, we look forward to uh, speaking with you again uh, in the Q&A and discussion, discussion session. Uh, just checking with control room, uh, if we have Jonathan Eddy, if not, we'll move on uh, with, with the next section. We don't have a little, unfortunately. No? Okay, great. So if he is able to join us at any point, we'll revert to uh, uh, Jonathan again uh, as we go. So in the next section, uh, we have two presentations, one from Santander, myself, and then uh, from DIT. Uh, so I'll start with the Santander one, if I may. That, that's myself. So, um, Thank you for joining again this session. So, as I mentioned uh, earlier, um, my name is Halil Badevi. I head up the Rail Aerospace Defense and Advanced Manufacturing uh, subsectors at Santander Corporate and Commercial here in the UK. Uh, background wise, I'm a chartered engineer with uh, 30 plus years in manufacturing industry in roles ranging from engineering, manufacturing, uh, general management, and consulting. So, I'm not a banker by background. And my role at Santander is very much an industrial or a non-banking one uh, with both internal and external facing elements. Uh, I work with our sector specialists and uh, manufacturing teams 
uh, sorry, within sector specialists and manufacturing teams. And internally, I work closely uh, with and support my banking relationship, product specialist teams, and also the international team. And externally, I work with our prospects and customers and also ecosystem of partners. So what do I do? Uh, I provide sector specialist input to assist Santander with its dealings with manufacturers and the sector ecosystem relating to the uh, above four subsectors. And um, also I help um, help our manufacturing customers uh, to grow and prosper. So that, that's my role. So what does this involve? It involves uh, some strategy uh, and growth in my subsectors, delivering tailored products and solutions, which are both financial and non-financial. Uh, as I said, working and managing the ecosystem of partners uh, relating to the uh, four subsectors I manage and also identifying and facilitating opportunities, both domestic and international. So um, if you can go to the next slide, please. So I'll tell you a tiny bit more about Santander as we go along, but I thought I'll just dive straight into our trade barometer research findings. Uh, these are uh, what you can see on the screen are the key, um, six key challenges that companies face as revealed by the, the research we conduct, uh, which monitors business sentiment towards growth risk and international trade. So this is what, what companies are telling us uh, that, that, that uh, are important to them and which are uh, kind of hurdles. So one is uh, trusted connections. 26% uh, of the people uh, are saying that, you know, the ability to meet and decide on viable, trustworthy and quality partners is, is very important and a challenge to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, finding trusted partners, uh, connections and customers is a key operational challenge in, in global markets. I think uh, we've had an indication of this from uh, uh, Rita earlier on. Um, so that's one. Second one is bureaucracy you know, being able to navigate the regulatory and cultural landscape of the markets. Um, this is uh, the biggest uh, hurdle. 44% of the companies are saying that, you know, overcoming bureaucracy is uh, a most common operational challenge in international markets for them. Uh, next one is uh, supply chain and logistics. These are the costs and lead times. Um, so, um, you know, 36% of the companies are saying supply chain and logistics is, is, a, is an issue. Uh, next one is banking, you know, handling cross-border payments, chargebacks, returns, and so on is a key barrier. Um, setting up, this is accessing new markets, setting up to operate at the other end or with the other end. This is 24% and skills, you know, skills uh, keep coming up over the years, um, recruitment skills, access to right skills doesn't seem to go away. 17% of the companies uh, are reporting that, that that's a, a major issue. In addition, you know, many companies believe that they will see growth in the next three years. And many companies, many domestic companies are considering international expansion. So the above are important areas uh, we and our ecosystems uh, can help with uh, over and above banking and finance. Yes, uh, as we've heard, international trading and growth makes sense and it is an opportunity, but challenges do exist. So no one can pretend it's easy or uh, can do it alone. Uh, this is usually not possible or takes much longer and it, it carries risks. So, uh, you know, there's a getting ready, market entry, getting established, growth and succeeding. Now, help and support is needed and uh, obviously, uh, you know, um, with what we call uh, trade facilitation. Uh, we are, of course, a bank and provide a wide range of banking services and banking and finance are, of course, important, but we realize that we need to help businesses succeed, grow and prosper beyond just banking and finance. Uh, why? Because what companies are looking for in their growth and international uh, trading journey is, is more than simply financial support. 
but all the things above and more. So we focus on uh, helping uh, businesses grow domestically as well as internationally. And now how do we do this? The setup we have is that we have sectors and countries focus uh, with dedicated teams of manufacturing and sector specialists and also international and country specialists uh, who can assist companies at every step of their manufacturing and international uh, trading journeys. Uh, these are two differentiators for us. And uh, you can see uh, some of our solutions or summary of our solutions on the, on the right hand side, you know, providing end to end support, sectoral and global ecosystem um, kind of uh, help. Speaking about global, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, so for those of you who are not uh, very familiar with Santander, you know, Santander has an international footprint with presence in 10 core countries and many more via our network of alliance banks in numerous other corridors. Um, we are around 148, uh, we have 148 million customers globally, uh, just under 200,000 employees and um, 20,000 in the UK in round numbers. Uh, we committed to supporting uh, manufacturing and rail is one of our main manufacturing subsectors or focus. So why are international trading and international growth so important? Uh, well, uh, rail is of course a global industry and doing business only domestically in the UK uh, can be limiting. And as we've heard from Rita, uh, could be uh, a, a risk as well in terms of concentration. So as the backdrop of increased trading complexity, protectionism, competition uh, and change and uncertainty evolves, companies are increasingly reviewing their resilience and growth stra strategies. So companies are increasingly looking to trade internationally and looking to grow beyond Europe and their traditional markets, partly to improve their resilience, reduce concentration risk, and of course, uh, increase sales. There are of course, always uh, opportunities uh, beyond the challenges. So um, how do we help uh, companies, how do we work together to get over these challenges? If you can have the next slide, please, Amat. So these are some of the things available to companies from us to support them uh, in navigating the manufacturing sector. Now, the whole aim is really three things, is to help companies save money, save time, and help, help them to grow. Um, so I'll just whiz through this quickly, uh, going clockwise. Uh, industry, industry insights are very important. So we provide industry insights to our frontline relationship and banking teams, as well as our customers and sometimes to prospects. These include reports, blogs, articles, webinars, conference and bespoke one-to-one uh, -one, uh, conversations. I think it's important for us internally to understand the industry and, and follow the trends, uh, but also communicate uh, some of the findings uh, with our uh, customers. Uh, risk management and supply chain, again, considering risks and applying to supply chain, whether it's environmental concentration, it's a very important area. People and skills. Um, I think just saying that we have a skills problem and someone should do something about it is not enough. So supporting the industry uh, to address uh, skills gaps through uh, help schemes is very important. Uh, we have a dedicated Santander universities team who work with 86 UK universities and uh, help with funding uh, and also matching graduates with positions in companies uh, which is partly funded so that skills flow from universities into the uh, industry in the UK. This is part of a global scheme and so far we've spent 1.8 billion euros uh, since 2002 um, and helped uh, 430,000 uh, university scholarships uh, and grants and so on. So that's uh, skills. Um, and this is available to everybody. You, you don't even have to bank with Santander. So it's a genuine giveaway uh, for the industry. 
Uh, bureaucracy and logistics, as we discussed, uh, very important. It's about understanding the regulatory and logistical challenges, uh, understanding cultures, how to work with people at the other end, um, very important area. And we have a dedicated transport and logistics um, uh, function as well. We can work with companies, whether it's logistics, legal, market entry, compliance, uh, and tenders, and so on. Last but not least, obviously, funding uh, and growth is, is important. Uh, yes, we provide a wide spectrum of products and services, and new, uh, numerous tailored financial solutions are available. Um, some of these are things like supplier finance, you know, R&D, uh, tooling, growth capital, project finance, green, um, structured finance, you know, pre and pro pre and post deal support and so on. So um, there isn't any, you know, a lot of time to go through these, unfortunately, but just to give you a flavor of some of the things which are available. Um, so, uh, and connectivity and, and, and expertise, again, all about identifying opportunities and opening new markets in the UK and, over, and overseas. So help with trusted connections, uh, business development opportunities with demand gaps and so on uh, is critical and we recognize that. So our own connectivity and sectors and countries expertise comes from our involvement with the industry directly and presence on the on the ground in other countries. So um, next slide, please. Just a little bit more on, on connecting with uh, opportunities. Um, these are some of the things that we do, uh, trade missions, which are overseas and virtual, webinars such as this one. Digi we have various digital platforms to help industry connect with suppliers and, and customers, uh, meet the buyer events, bespoke industry events such as the Santander Manufacturing Day, Santander Manufacturing Week and offering the whole ecosystem of partners, which uh, include you know, universities, organizations such as, such as trade bodies, government, DIT, uh, Santander and other parts of the world, and industry thought leaders, influencers, as well as service providers and experts uh, in things like compliance, automation, legal, market entry, and so on. So that's all from me. Uh, many thanks for listening and uh, we'll go to the next section. That's what concludes my bit. I will now hand you over to uh, Alan Goodliff from DIT, who is a senior trade advisor for in infrastructure construction and mobility. So Alan, over to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Halil. Um, yes, we've already given the introduction there. It's pretty much what's on my first slide. But yes, I'm Alan Goodliff, um, Senior Trade Advisor based at the British Embassy in Stockholm, DIT Sweden. Um, I'm just going to give a little run through, really, of, of the kind of support and, and where to look for it uh, within DIT. Donald alluded to it earlier, uh, some of this, so we've got a bit of a, a double, I might, you might say. But um, there are three main sources of information really and, and, and support from DIT's side. Um, probably the first place to start is really online and that can often give it, answer some initial questions, give some pointers, that kind of thing. So the first source is really great.gov.uk which um, yeah again contains a lot of market info, sources of advice etc and various online services uh, and as Donald mentioned earlier um, last week we launched the export support service uh, which has seen um, an increase in, in offices uh, in, both in the UK and, and Europe, I think. So that can also be a good place to go to for initial, uh, if you've got some initial questions. In all likelihood, market specific questions will then get filtered, in, for Europe's case, at least to the Europe Trade Hub, um, which they may be able to answer at the Trade Hub or possibly then pass them on to office, trade officers like myself. Um, in the UK itself, we have a network of international trade advisors across the UK. Uh, some of them are specialists, so some of them I deal with, deal with, for example, rail uh, in particular, come from the industry. Others are generalists, but uh, it varies. I mean, for example, 
uh, East Midlands, for example, with, with Derby in the rail cluster there as a specialist, uh, or had at least before, certainly, um, whereas others, perhaps other less rail intensive uh, areas may, may not have. But everybody will no doubt do their best to, uh, to assist, uh, help with market selection, those kind of things, the kind of things that Rita was talking about before. Um, we are seeing, a, I won't go into any depth and it's not really my area, but we are, there is a bit of a shifting of resources within England, I think as well, and the wider UK, DIT is opening new offices uh, in, in Darlington, a bigger uh, sort of co-HQ, I think, as well as in, in Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales, um, to complement what's already on offer there. And uh, some shifting of resources within England too, I think, from probably the south toward the north a little bit, just as a part of the whole leveling up agenda. Um, and there's a link down there as well where you can find, uh, if you're not already in contact with your local DIT office in the UK, um, get in touch with them, just drop your postcode in there, it'll tell you which one's the closest, drop them a, an email or something like that, and they'll be able to put you in touch with an ITA who can come around and, or, well, possibly come around or possibly just <laughs> have some sort of online call, but something of that nature. And then in Europe, which we're, which I'm a part of, obviously in Sweden, and this is the uh, this is the Europe team that's organised this event in collaboration with something there. So we've got uh, trade advisors located at embassies and consulates all around the region, but of course not just in Europe, all around the world as well. And we work pretty closely together uh, historically. We, we in Sweden have worked very closely with our Nordic and Baltic neighbours, and that's uh, widened out to being uh, the European region over the past few years as well, as that's become uh, more important to be able to share um, best practice amongst ourselves, but also be able to have a better awareness of what's going on in other markets um, in order to be able to help clients more by quickly connecting them up uh, with colleagues. So it's not the case necessarily that rail infrastructure will have will be a specific focus in every market, but uh, no doubt every market will try to do their best to support and help uh, where they can, uh, as in, in Sweden, in um, uh, and then to be honest elsewhere across the, certainly the Nordic region, Denmark, Norway, uh, somewhat Finland, there's the Rail Baltica projects in or project going across the uh, um, Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, down to Poland, uh, possibly eventually a tunnel project connecting Estonia and uh, and Finland. So there's a lot going on in our, in our part of the world, but also um, you know across the region really. In terms of services, really quite a lot of what we do is very much mirrored by um, Halil's earlier slide, things like trade missions, it can be either something that we're creating kind of from scratch, but more, more likely bolting onto something that's already existing in market, possibly setting up a group stand or some other form of activity in that way, briefings, etc. Um, it can also be bespoke market research. Uh, if, for example, if you take the route of the uh, distributors and agents, for example, and having trouble you know, pinpointing who that might be, that's something we can also try to help. It's one of, uh, one of the services we still offer. And also a lot of what we do in DIT these days isn't purely the export support per se, but trade policy related and market access related. Um, particularly since uh, since Brexit with the uh, withdrawal agreement, it can be the case that not all European markets apply the, the agreement in exactly the same way. Some um, may kind of gold plate the legislation or something like that a little bit, add extra um, requirements. Uh, and if that is the case and they need to be negotiated or navigated, that can also be something where uh, we can perhaps help. It's not my area of expertise personally, but uh, we do have a trade poli policy office in Stockholm and across uh, several of them across the region, as well as uh, new market access officers uh, who are specifically tasked with with helping to, uh, to navigate that, those kind of situations and help companies. Um, I can mention as well that uh, it may be of interest, we're going to have a, uh, for Sweden's part, a UK Suppliers Day with the Swedish Transport Administration in mid-November, the 17th, so which we're just working on that now. So um, I'll be putting out some uh, some invitations hopefully shortly, probably posting it on, on LinkedIn as well, so do keep an eye out for that. It'll um, be a mixture of, to be honest, rail and road, because the, the Transport Administration covers both, uh, so projects from both rail and road. And the biggest um, ticket item, you might say, in Sweden at the moment is the its foray into what well, was basically high speed rail, um, medium high speed rail at least. It's uh, planned to be around total of around 600 kilometers of new double track um, throughout the southern kind of third of Sweden, uh, connecting up the main cities of Stockholm 
um, Gothenburg and Malmö. Um, I didn't really have much more than that. If anybody's got any specific questions about the support that DIT can offer, then I'll be happy to take it in the uh, in the Q and A session. Otherwise, thank you very much, Alan. Alan, thank you, thank you very much for uh, your session, and uh, I look forward to uh, interacting again in in the next session. So, uh, we are doing very well uh, with time. Um, so we are uh, slightly early, in fact. So we can. Start the Q and A and discussion session if that's okay. Uh, if uh, Jonathan is able to join us, uh, please uh, let me know and we can uh, uh, link up with him. But we have some questions, and uh, uh, it'll be good to get into the discussion session. We, we'll keep it fairly informal, so please feel free to type in your questions or uh, uh, your thoughts or your, your your comments you may have on anything that we have discussed or, or, or as we go along. So uh, let's start with a question to Rita. Let me just uh, find that. Um, right, uh, Rita, there's a question for you. Um, it says, what's the balance between being able to understand the language in an overseas market and understanding the culture? Balance between language and culture. I uh, wonder if you can uh, say a few things on that, please. Thank you. Yes, actually, um, I didn't mention anything about language and culture because I knew there was going to be a, a question later. And uh, is the proverbial challenge of language and uh, cultural differences when you go abroad. Uh, you do have to recognize the cultural differences with whether you're dealing with a distributor or with your, empl your employees in your own business. Cultural differences are significant and it happens in our particular case that two of our largest markets, Australia and Americas, the culture are obviously most similar to uh, are similar to the UK. So finding business in Germany or in France or in the Nordic countries, it was actually a little bit more difficult. So, but I would say don't get put off by the language barrier. Uh, the language barrier, I think, can be overcome because all of those countries that I mentioned, they speak very good English. So that wouldn't be really your challenge. The challenge is the culture. The business culture is critical. And the, inter the Department for International Trade has had many, um, many programs in the past. I, I, I was a member of one in my early life uh, working for a university. We had a program where we were supporting exporters then with business culture so they, they, there is plenty of help out there um to to help you overcome some of the difficulties in the, in, in the culture and and don't underestimate them because uh they are there um but um so yes it would be easy to do a business with the country that you share the culture with but is not uh, um, is is not a real barrier as such. It's just something that you have to keep into into consideration. For instance, when we when we went uh, to Japan on a European uh, supported uh, trade mission of uh, in uh, 2017, um, we were you know we, we were given a lot of presentations on. Um, all the etiquette side, how the Japanese like to do business, which was, you know, completely new to us. And uh, it was essential that we knew those kind of things. And because we knew it, we, you know, we were able to, you know, to arrive prepared to deal with them in the way that they are accustomed to, so that the distance between the perceived distance between their culture and yours is reduced. I don't know if that answered the question, but. Happy to expand, you know. Thank you, Rita. Ian, I, I'm not sure if you'd like to say anything on, on that from uh, your perspective. And I think, as Rita is saying, 
is not always the language or even the culture of the general uh, region, but a business culture can be uh, different. So uh, I wonder what your experience is and what your uh, sort of tips uh, are uh, to the audience on that. Well, yeah, because we actually got headlong into um, Central America and uh, South America as one of the first areas. They, they'd read about the battery trade um, were contacting us very early stages and we realised that was going to be quite difficult and tricky for us. Um, luckily, our investor, our major investor, did have experience in that sector, so he was able to tip us off with uh, quite a few ideas and thoughts on what to watch out for. And what we did was we appointed an agent in Mexico who had strong links across um, South America to work with us and effectively have worked closely with them ever since. Um, one of the things we've had to get used to is a completely different concept of time because they move at the pace of a snail when we were trying to rush things for them and get things organised, but very quickly realised that wasn't necessary because their, uh, their pace of operation was quite slow. Um, but uh, no, it's, it, I think it's horses for courses. Um, and Australasia, obviously, Australia is very easy for us and we've negotiated that directly. Central America, different fish altogether and you have to handle it differently. Right, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, next one is something Rita has mentioned, so perhaps I should go to Rita uh, mm -hmm. initially with this one. He says, in your view, how important is it to have a local in-country partner? And have you had the dif have you had the difficulties with finding one? Um, well, so... the short answer the short answer is yes, it's essential to have a partner. Uh, that's why uh, our strategy in the main has been that we first start with an agent. Uh, depending on the amount of business, we then move on to a distributor, and only. And, and then once we are more established as a brand there, then we move on to uh, taking control and, and buy out our, our partners, etc. However, having said that, um, for instance, in the Americas, uh, we started uh, with distributors, but um, and I'm talking about Canada and the United States both. But um, we actually helped the distributor because we had an excellent relationship with them. And so they have one part of the territory in Canada and we cover another part. And it works fine, you know, it was absolutely well for us. Um, and we continue this relationship. So it depends on the country, it depends on your distributor. Uh, the partner is a very important aspect of your of your um, exporting uh, journey, um, and uh, and it makes a, a, a big big difference. Uh, so we always try uh, to cultivate a relationship with the distributor and to make sure that is the right person for us to represent us. Because as we said, we are very strong about cascading our values, our, our mission, and, you know, our, our, our reason to be as, as a company. And therefore, it's important for us that, that that part doesn't get diluted. But obviously, it gets to a point that when you, if you have a distributor that cannot dedicate enough time to your company, then you know that that's the time for you to move in because obviously nobody is going to do as good a job as you, your employees will do. Thank you. Ian, I wonder if the situation is different in your case because uh, you are a, a, a different size and type of a company to Altro. And, you know, they're very sort of multinational already. You are an innovative, smaller uh, company. What, what's your experience in, uh, uh, you know, having as somebody at the other end is that more challenging more difficult for you what so how did you um, tackle that yeah with with um, south america central america they very quickly came over to see us um, and we showed them the products and took them through everything 
and then went back and had a couple of visits over to them just pre and just as COVID really hit. Um, so we were able to get a reasonable amount of information across to them. And of course, in this day and age, with the wonders of Zoom and Teams and WebEx and everything else, we're, we're, we're better, far better able to cope with communication than ever before. In Europe, we appointed a past European senior director in rail to act as our representative, and he travelled across Europe again pre-COVID. That, that, that developed and coalesced into some particularly serious interest in Germany, and luckily, uh, again, our investor had a, a strong contact, a very um, eminent um, rail uh, character who, who's been assisting in that area. Um, so, as luck would have it, we seem to have managed to cope more by accident than design, I suppose, is the best way of describing it, um, with, with the challenges that we've had. And as I said, the other inquiries from Australasia and Singapore and, and these other things have come through from our articles on LinkedIn and people reading about us in the rail journals and things, which has brought them to our door rather than us have to go chasing them. So this 700 million pound potential pipeline of work that we, we keep looking at thinking, wow, isn't this fantastic? Um, uh, we, we're having to develop it in bite-sized chunks in a small company, otherwise we, we get swamped, I think is probably the best way of describing it. Okay, thank you. While I've got you, Ian, um, the next two questions kind of relate uh, to one another and uh, also what, what we're seeing, in fact. So it says, is the size of a company a barrier to international trading? So how, how much of a barrier is the size? How important is the size of the company? And then it follows on, it says, would a move from components to systems open more doors to UK companies? I think that comes from a kind of suggestion or, or some experiences that uh, it's difficult to get companies parts into trains, if you like, into the infrastructure. But if you supply a whole system that can go into an OEM, I, I don't know, it might be a door system, for example, rather than a handle. Um, what, what's your uh, impression of that, Ian? Well, again, we were lucky, weren't we? Because with what we what we had, it was newsworthy, it was big, and it was yeah. seeable. If we were selling a widget on the, the other hand, that would have been a completely different situation. Um, now, we are beginning to spin parts out from what we're doing. So the power units that we as a company have developed are modular anyway, so they can be retrofitted to other locomotives and trains, which is a very positive um, situation because we can fit it on any loco or any passenger unit within reason. Um, also, um, the fast charge units that we've developed for um, third rail fast charging in, in under 10 minutes with specialist batteries means that, again, it's, it's a whole thing. We'll have better experience of selling components as a result of where we're going now, because uh, there are things we're gonna be doing which we will be selling Control boxes and the like because of what we've developed on our journey. So it's something we will then be struggling to do, probably, because I think it's going to be a very different thing to market and sell internationally with a yep. control box than ever it was with a whole control pack. Power yep. pack, sorry. Oh, thank you. I mean, th thinking logically, I, I guess size matters to, to some extent because, you know, um, uh, below a certain size, uh, then the, there may not be the expertise, the resources to, uh, you know, deal with uh, a number of things and, 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 and budgets and so on. So I suppose there is something in the size. So it is uh, important for companies to grow to or beyond a certain, uh, what we might call the minimum size. So that, that might make things a, a little bit easier, I guess, naturally. So, um, uh, in terms of, you know, uh, bids come up quite often, you know, how to, you know, tenders and bids, and we're lucky to have uh, 
Rita with us, who is a global bid manager. So, um, you know, it would be wonderful, Rita, if you can tell us a few things about uh, bids and tenders, you know, um, how, how would companies go about bidding or yeah. tendering? And obviously now this time, I, I'm, I'm sure the size will matter because very small companies, uh, I guess, won't have the, the capacity to, uh, you know, enter major bids and, and uh, kind of tenders themselves. Is there a way of, of, of kind of clubbing together or supplying into the next tier who, they, who can then bid their product to the OEMs? I wonder if you can enlighten us on that, yeah. please, Rita. Right. It's a, it's, a, yeah. it's a question that is a, uh, it's, it's quite complex to answer, but I'm going to try to, to, to do my best. First of all, I will say, um, yeah, the size of, of an organization matters because depending on who you you contracting with, some of the contractual clauses will be very onerous and mm -hmm. uh, you need to have some sort of uh, financial robustness about your company in order to be able to tender for certain contracts. However, having said that, if your product is niche or is less uh, common than um, other components or systems, then you have a more leeway in negotiating terms and conditions because they can only ask you, they can only get it from a few suppliers. So they have to make, they have to make some arrangements for, for that. Otherwise, they, they're not going to have the piece that they need. But for instance, that's also, uh, it depends also where in the world this is happening. For instance, in America, there are, there are no um, OEMs that are like uh, from, from, from they are native of the country. So, they rely on a lot of uh, suppliers from, from abroad. So they have, uh, again, um, uh, less bandwidth. In terms of the bids, how, how, how they work, etc. you have all sorts of different uh, models because some companies are and it also depends on, on your product, what kind of product you're selling, if it's a fairly, if it's a crucial one or, you know, if it's a safety critical or, or, or whatever. But um, depending on, on that, you might have a very complex tender. I just received one yesterday, in fact, um, from one of the global OEMs, which expect a level of, uh, of detail and a level of, of quality control that it's quite taxing and it will require, you know, a lot of work. But also you get a simple request by email, two lines, and then you have to like try to get all the other documentation, you know, with the repeated requests by an email. And, uh, and they're just happy to, uh, to ask you for a price. However, in my experience, when people ask you for, an, you know, when, when people send you a request for quotation and you didn't even know that the project existed, um, most likely you were just a benchmark um, supply, uh, supplier for them. They just want to see how, how much they can uh, squeeze the, the other supplier that they're dealing with. So um, I won't. Uh, I won't lie that these rail, rail bids can be really complex, but I wouldn't get put off because there are pl there is plenty of business that will not be that difficult. There is a lot to do with the relationship. If you establish a good relationship with the procurement managers, the engineering, the quality manager, if you can have more than one content, don't rely. This is my biggest tip. Don't rely on the one content for your, you know, your sales person that knows someone in procurement. That will not do. You really have to develop multiple relationships. 
Great, thank you very much. Ian, again, uh, we, we're lucky that we have uh, you know, two kind of different companies here. Yours is more uh, emerging technology, smaller company. Uh, are bids and uh, tenders relevant to yourselves or do those products operate in, in slightly different, different ways at, at this uh, kind of level of maturity in terms of the technology? No, very relevant. Um, it, they are very big contract tenders because most of them are tied up into even bigger ones than ours. In actual fact, our contracts are small when procuring for a rail line. And the, the, the Central American bid is for a whole new rail network and includes um, cutting through mountains and all sorts of things with military involvement and so on and so forth. So we have to pitch into those contracts um, as best we can. Again, that's where it helps to have an agent in the area to assist us and translate and work with us, understand the politics so importantly over there. Um, and, and again, it was a, it was a, a very interesting and kind of eye-opening um, period to try to pitch for the contracts that we have. But luckily, as I say, it's a, the smaller end of the pitch. We're not having to into the into the bigger contract um so uh, yeah we, we without that help we'd be lost um to be honest um there are similarities between the types of contracts over here insofar as we've had to bid in the franchise contracts over here in the uk which are large contracts again and, and again our little fleet of trains is small in comparison to the big fleets that are being bid in our biggest issue is a lot of the contracts that we look at are for these larger fleets and therefore can be quite onerous for a small fleet because suddenly you've got to produce similar amounts of so for example manpower coverage to maintain the product um, uh, they want 24 7 cover but if you're providing a huge fleet of trains that's quite cost effective because you you employ a panel of a group of individuals you train them uh, and, and they can crack on with it. Whereas it's not just about selling the product itself, it's actually maintaining it and having the resources to maintain it 24 seven in some cases. So it, it's complicated. It's very complicated. Great, thank you. Ian, while, while I've got you there, uh, <clears throat> next question is, is for uh, both Viva Rail and Altro. Really. It says, what is your experience working with the DIT teams overseas, uh, if any, of course, what kind of support from the teams is the, is the most helpful? Are there any areas for improvement in terms of mitigating market access barriers? So uh, what, what's the, the experience and what is the requirement really in, in your view uh, in terms of how to kind of work together and, and receive support? So if you can start with Ian and maybe go to retail on that. Um, yeah, the, uh, hello. The, the basically, the um, Central American one is the example we have to give back again, and New York we spoke with in detail. The more relevant one is Central America because there we spoke with the Embassy of Mexico, um, and uh, they were very helpful. The UK Embassy providing us background on our customers, the, the political situation, the individuals concerned, um, and uh, that, that was invaluable. Um, New York has been good in actually connecting things up. We, we've had, we've spoken with the team in New York. Um, they've actually met with our UK con our US contacts, um, been for cups of coffee with them, um, and actually have helped hopefully build better rapport and far greater confidence in the product because of those connections. I think um, we had letters provided to us for Central America of support from the UK government, which we put into our contract, which was very helpful. So uh, uh, all things being considered, this is why I said working closely with the team here in the UK and the team over in the country's concern is really very useful. It, but on that one, it, uh, point of feedback for the UK government, it, because of their internal procedures and controls, it can be terribly slow. And when you're trying to pitch quickly against a timeline, that can be a bit of a hurdle and that, that we did experience issues there. 
And so tip there is to allow plenty of time. If you are, are after something because of the inter internal checks and balances, allow plenty of time. Thank Hopefully you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, Rita, I wonder if we can get your yeah. response or thoughts on that, please. Well, uh, I only have a nice thing to say about the Department of International Trade. So, um, first of all, uh, we've been, you know, we've been very lucky to take advantage of, of various services that, that are around the world. And I, I personally have visited, you know, many embassies and, and always had very, very good uh, um, feedback to give afterwards. Uh, some of the things that, uh, well, I think in the UK in general, we're very lucky because we have a very active Department of International Trade. We have the, um, the Rail Industry Association, the Rail Forum Midlands, which, which all, are all collaborated with the Department of International Trade. And they give us even a better a, a better value out of the relationship. Um, for us, what works the best is like, for instance, I have to give a shout to Sylvia Pivovar uh, here because whenever I have a meet, I have a, 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 a I attend a networking event or an event that uh, Sylvia is present. She is particularly good at introducing us to the key people that we want to meet in an organization that perhaps we don't, we haven't, uh, we're not known yet, like a rail, a rail transport authorities or a particular OEM that might have a representative there. That obviously is very helpful for us because personally, I'm quite extroverted and I, I, I can establish relationship easily uh, but I have a lot of my colleagues who are not at all like that, and I'm trying to bring them all, bring them to attend these events. But some of them don't, you know, they find it very hard to, you know, to break the, the moment where you have to introduce yourself, etc. Even though they're salespeople, it's different in a, you know, in a in a group situation. Yeah. So I would say, whenever there are events, if uh, the, you know, if we have the delegate list in advance and we can say, oh, you know, I really would love to meet this person. Do you know them yourself? And then at the event, try to introduce us. And the other thing I would uh, recommend as, as an improvement, not an improvement, but, you know, uh, on my wish list would be a little bit more advanced notice for, um, for trade missions and things like that because a lot of times it happens in the past that we wanted to participate but we just didn't have the time logistically to organize it for the right people you know to to get the right people to go to the mission to prepare the documentation etc cetera, etc cetera. so that probably is something that would help us to to participate yeah as i said thank, thank you. you very much for all you guys do because it's like Really, really helpful. Thank you, Rita. There as well, of course. You know, it's thank, been thank, really... thank you very much. No, I, I have to. I have to say, you know, I'll add, I'd add in my uh, my own thoughts uh, on this. Uh, I think. I think you, you know there are um, sometimes criticism of DIT banks uh, and 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 so on and the other way. We do need to listen and improve and learn from that, obviously, but. As as Rita, I think mentioned, I completely agree <clears throat> that there is a, a uh, there are different ways of approaching, asking the question, focusing, and getting involved to be then able to get more help out of uh, uh, you know whether it's government, banks, uh, you know, or, or, or all the other uh, support system. So it is important to have the right approach, the right uh, you know uh, way of connecting. Really, uh, I completely agree, um, and and sort of say, look, this is my product. This is a USP uh, in very simple terms, uh, and that sticks in people's minds. Uh, you know, and you know, it's it's really good to linking linking that to R and D because that's one of the questions: is how important is kind of Product and R and D. Now, you know, 
R and D leads to a differentiated product. Uh, sometimes, you know, unique product. So, it's very important to have that, because without a product that is uh, uh, attractive to uh, overseas buyers, um, it, it becomes more difficult to uh, export or sell it. Uh, price competitiveness, competitiveness is, is the other one, and then obviously the ability to market and sell that product. So, if nobody knows that. Uh, a company has a, has a wonderful product, then it becomes uh, very easy. And then, of course, having all those uh, right, then going through uh, the, the issues with bureaucracy, the standards and all the things that, that we've mentioned. So talking about that, that links into a question on standards, really, and the uh, transition period. It says after the transition period, is there a certification approval process uh, within the EU market, how, you know, is that a barrier? Have things changed in terms of standards? Uh, what, what's the this, this situation, please? Maybe we'll start with Rita. Um, is there a major change in standards? Who, whose standards do you work to? Um, we work to the EN, uh, EN 45545, uh, mostly, okay. and, uh, and also ASTM and and okay. uh, um, the one for the Americas. Uh, so it depends on the country that we okay. that we are approaching. But our, the major one will be the EN um, standard. Okay. EN but is that different? Is that different in your case or? Mm, no, it's, it's the only thing we find sometimes is like uh, we get. We get asked the BS and the BS standard, uh, but also the AEN. So basically, we 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 just stick with the AEN because for us it's 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 easier um, because that covers more regions. So we try to have all our products at at, uh, at the level of the AEN um, standard that we that we work on. Okay. okay. Great. Is that different in your case, Ian? Ours is slightly different insofar as when we're getting rails uh, trains out on the on the line, they obviously have their own country, their own country standards. And for example, US was completely different when it came to getting our train on the on the rails in the US. It was really quite interesting because there they basically take a train and you have to be able to crash it into a brick wall and it would stand all sorts of impacts. Um, unlike the Japanese who work on crash structures and things. The Americans is just whack it against a really great solid structure and make sure it survives. Um, our aluminium trains wouldn't actually work in that uh, situation. So the way we, we were very closely with one of their heads of standards who came over from the US and met us all. Um, and basically uh, he, he was able to, to, to advise and we're able to work. The workaround effectively is uh, they have lots of lines with freight that are underutilized and so the trains that we're going to be selling to the US will be going onto lines that are um, uh, free at night or days, and sorry, free in um, rush hour time because they're not running freight through it at that time. And therefore, because it's we're on the line on our on our own, we don't have to comply. So it's all it's a very long answer, I suppose, to quite a straightforward question. It all depends, um, and and it and it, it is all quite different depending on the world where you are. Right, thank you very much for that. I'm just checking uh, what the latest is in terms of questions. Uh, right, I hope I haven't lost you all because it's gone off my screen. We lost your video, that's all. Right, am I back on now? Wonders yes. of technology. Yes. Excellent. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, we have a few more questions. I uh, just wonder if there's anything anybody else would like to uh, say, add at this point. Um, uh, yes, I was going to add uh, to the question about um, what, what uh, kind of support is the most helpful. Um, also, uh, I, I find very helpful the any, any reports that the Department of International Trade prepares uh, on research on market research. 
And mm -hmm. um, for instance, recently I contacted, um, I've been in contact with a with the Turkey team, uh, Turkish team, and I've had uh, meetings, separate meetings with some of them where they compile a list of uh, information that I needed and because we are trying to understand better the market because Turkey is not at the moment one of our resource markets and and, and there, there are a lot of opportunities uh, over there so things like that are really really helpful when you are in the sort of a preparation phase before you you decide to to start the trading in that market and and I find that all this support between the reports, presentations, and uh, actual um, uh, market research that, that the, the trade advisor do is very helpful. Great. Yes, I mean, e insights is, uh, uh, as shown by the trade barometer research as well, it is really, really important to sort of uh, know what's going on, what information is available. Uh, in terms of reports, other bespoke um, insights, it's very, very helpful. Um, one of the questions is, what do you, what do you, what do you need most support with? It's connections, uh, awareness of opportunities or projects, customs, regulations. I guess you know this will be different uh, from one company to another, and uh, it changes with products, I guess. Uh, but I wonder how we would answer this one. If I go to Ian with this one, what do you need most support with? I suppose that will be in your case, uh, unless you you know uh, more generally in the in the rail industry, and perhaps you can share uh, that insight with us, Ian. Um, well, it, rail is pretty specific, especially when you're trying to get a train on the line in different countries, as I've just explained. Um, but but it's it, it's more the detail. For us, because we have people who, uh, and through our investors as well, who have operated rail across the world. Um, so we're very lucky to have the bigger picture, but it's the paperwork and the detail and the connections. We, again, we're, we're, we're quite passive. We have to wait for people to come to us. So if there was a major opportunity that cropped up at the other side of the world, we wouldn't know about it necessarily. Um, so opportunities, uh, paperwork, general idea, gen gen general help and handholding as we develop connections in countries where people, you know, where, where, where UK government assistance is invaluable because they've got people on the floor um, in the countries. Sure, thank you. Thanks for that. I'm just checking the questions again. Um, Yeah, there's one question about regions. Uh, regions of biggest interest to UK companies in rail supply chain opportunities. Um, now, yeah, I mean, again, that that will that will change, of course. And and I know that there are so many rail projects going on within Europe and and globally as well at the moment. I suppose there are opportunities everywhere but uh, I wonder if there's any any information as to which regions mess uh, may be best suited to what UK has to offer uh, for whatever reason uh, it may be that uh, um, you know that they're easier to to work with culturally <laughs> in, in terms of standards and so on and in terms of uh, the uh, the products the technologies UK has to offer. Um, Ian, any any ideas in, in your uh, in your in your case, and then we'll go over to Rita uh, about sort of best regions to look out for or work with uh, for UK companies. Well, obviously, it's it's easier in the countries that speak the lingo. Yeah, and it's easier for us in countries that are likely to base themselves on the UK standards. We're very lucky because UK rail is very highly thought of around the world, and therefore network rail um, and what they do is quite a key facilitator. For instance, 
we're working with them very closely over the fast charge. Um, and if we, yeah. if and when we get that approved uh, in the UK, we would anticipate that will open doors to other other markets in other countries because because it's been approved by Network Rail in the UK, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's very important consideration. Um, and I think uh, somebody said uh, standards obviously matters as well. And I know uh, perhaps people, uh, countries like Aus Aus Australia are closer to you know, UK standards and way of, ways of working. Exactly. So that, that may be a good opportunity. Um, Rita, any, any comments from you on that, uh, please, in terms of regions? Mm -hmm. I, I subscribe to what uh, uh, Ian said, and uh, I would add that, I mean, although for Altro, the Americas has been the, the most successful subsidiary, um, but uh, it is a very, very difficult market to enter. Yeah. <laughs> I would, uh, I would uh, recommend to first to sort of own experience in other markets and then and then invest uh, you know, your resources once you, you know you're a little bit more um, experienced but it, um sorry I the question was uh, uh which regions may be best for uk region, companies but, to, to work uh, with or uh... obviously the pipeline uh of what's to come is an important one uh so if you can, you know, if, if you can access that kind of market. So, for instance, the Middle East, that up, up to five years ago, there were so many opportunities. Um, and if someone had already uh, an agent or distributor there, was a good time to, you know, to invest yeah. in that. Um, right now, my, my money is on probably on Turkey <laughs> uh, in terms of... Okay. Uh, the amount, because first of all, the size of the country has got a rapid growth in terms of uh, um, uh, GDP growth and, and, and things like that. So if it won't be easy because there, there will be challenges uh, working in Turkey, but in terms of potential, I will certainly look into it and also um, the, the British uh, companies are the British company I'm seeing very well by by the by Turkish um, oper operators and uh, and um, uh, because they already they already uh, supporting a lot of projects there. So great, thank you for that. Yeah, if I can just add something on that before we carry on with the other questions. Uh, there are two schools of thoughts uh, in terms of you know markets to to enter. Sometimes people, uh, you know, say, look, go with the easy ones, the, the ones which have got similar standards and culture and so on. But then the others say, well, that's what everybody does. And sometimes it, it's good to consider, you know, different markets, perhaps uh, seemingly difficult markets, because there will be much less competition. So if you're able to get into a market that the others find difficult, that will may automatically give you a huge competitive advantage. So examples may be, you know, in Brazil and Mexico, regions like that, India, uh, where it may be more difficult to kind of get established and find the right contacts and so on. And th those are some of the areas we can certainly help with because we have, uh, you know, huge teams uh, on the other side and, you know, a big presence. So it's worth exploring those, I guess, as well. So um, I'm really uh, happy to say that we've got questions uh, coming in. So I'll, uh, uh, you know, start going through some of those uh, now. Um, one of them is uh, we are a, we are. It says we are with a great product line product that we have just started our international journey with. So the company who has a, a great product and they are just starting their international journey with, we would be interested in banking with Santander. That's good. Thank you for that. We're based in Cambridge. Who should we think? Who should 
you think we should speak with? So sorry, that's, that's, that's a direct question. Uh, I will uh, get back to you. I mean, please contact myself or Magda in the first case for uh, uh, here and uh, uh, hopefully you have our email uh, from the um, uh, event literature. If not, please, uh, you know, uh, contact us through LinkedIn or our website uh, and then we'll, we'll try and help you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, next one is how valuable are trade associations such as uh, APTA, APTA in the US? Uh, so value from trade associations. So I wonder if uh, Rita or Ian have got any uh, experience or knowledge of APTA in the US. Uh, um, it's not, well, it's not, one. yeah, um, great. Thank you, Rita. Yes, my, uh, well, I, I've attended myself uh, a couple of years ago, and my colleagues in the US attend uh, regularly. It is the big event of of the year. Um, but from my experience going there, it was there was very little rail, and there was uh, a lot of bus and coaches and. Uh, alternative vehicles, um, but the rail offer wasn't, I mean, there were the usual OEMs, there was Stadler, there was a CRRC, etc. But um, in terms of presence, it was like, if you used to say Innotrans or something like that, um, there isn't very much. In terms of this, in terms of what you can get, uh, in terms of the membership, I know that they have a, a, a member session on their website where they keep a lot of reports uh, and, and research that they do. So you would have access to those documents, which will be very useful, obviously. Um, so yes, it's it's valuable. Um, maybe not as valuable as the association that we have in the UK. I will say in terms of value for money, but. If you trade in America, is one of those that you know you need. You know, you you'll be a reward for you attending. Great, and, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if Ian has uh, any into Argo. No, we we were like because we've got an American investor who who's in the country. Huge experience. We we actually aren't a member. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know any uh, specific knowledge of that particular trade association, but we work with great many trade associations in the UK and also uh, around the, the globe in different in industries as well as rail. Uh, some are obviously, uh, you know, bigger and more helpful than others, but again, it really uh, there is an onus on on the uh, the company as well to try and uh, you know approach them and deal with them in the right way. Some will insist that you become a member before they talk to you. Some uh, will help you to uh, you know attract you to kind of get involved a bit more. Uh, you know uh, as you know, so give you a chance to try them out if you like. And provide some free open access reports and so on. So it's uh, it's good to shop around because there are so many uh, trade associations, even in the same country and same industry. So it's worth exploring uh, who is right for you. Um, you know, in terms of uh, kind of match uh, to your your uh, requirements and so on, and budget and so on. Um, and whether there are, uh, you know, ways of getting help and working with them uh, without being a, a member, or maybe they have different levels of membership. Uh, I think, uh, you know, both sides need to recognize that they need to um, you know, create sort of income and resources to be able to help the, the, the companies. So, uh, but also they need to give value for money as well. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's worth just knowing the ecosystem and and who is around, what's around, really, um, to get the best out of them. 
Thank you very much. So, um, yeah, I think we've covered most. Uh, there are other questions, but I think we've covered some of these in 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 our discussions and and other questions. Uh, just checking finally if I'm to make sure I'm not missing anything. I think I think we are pretty much done. Uh, we are, you know, fifteen or so minutes uh, early. Uh, it's a shame that we couldn't have a couple of the other speakers we were planning to for uh, different reasons. But uh, you know, I'm very grateful to Ian and Rita for uh, uh, you know joining us, uh, and also. Uh, Alan, obviously, Magda and Donald, and also Mauricio and Emma, who helped us behind the scenes to uh, put this uh, together. Um, hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch. Uh, we can keep in touch uh, for the future. So, um, unless there are any other comments or questions from anybody uh, in the panel, um, I will uh, wrap up. Just waiting. Okay, nothing. Many thanks. So this concludes nice. this uh, concludes this uh, virtual uh, event, and uh, would also like to thank very much to uh, the delegates who um, uh, joined in and uh, listened and participated with their questions and comments. Many thanks, uh, and all the best for now. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.